Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, sorry for my absence in the last couple of weeks. I had to travel for different reasons. Um, but we're continuing in the Kuzari today. And uh, we're on page 275. Thank you, Dante. We're on page 275. In the third essay. And what we were talking about is the behavior of a saintly person. And this led Rabbi Yehuda Halevi to go on to a discussion of the different kinds of mitzvot. And he divided the mitzvot into what we would call today chukim and mishpatim. There are two different kinds of mitzvahs, the rational laws and the laws that transcend rational understanding because they're given by God as the prescriber of what's good for us even when we don't understand fully the extent of why we have to do this mitzvah. The normally we would have, as we mentioned last time, which was a while ago, we would have expected a perfect example of a chok, of one of these very, uh, you know, cryptic mitzvos to be the mitzvah of parah duma, the red heifer. But that's not the example that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi chose. Instead, the example that he chose was the mitzvah of bris milah, of circumcision. And he pointed out that really it's a kind of mitzvah that uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense as to why God prescribed this as a sign of a covenant. Um, for, for, for one thing, it's not even visible um, because when you're dressed, it's not a visible sign of a covenant. Would have made more sense. Uh, to maybe have a, like a, a pierced ear or something like that as a marker uh, of a, that you're a member of the tribe. And, it's, um, and so that was one of the questions we asked is that why did Rev Yehuda Halevi choose the mitzvah of Brismila as the, his quintessential example of something that transcends human understanding? And we suggested at the time, and this is on page 275, we had suggested at the time that part of the, um, the counterintuitiveness of this mitzvah is not just that the details of the mitzvah don't really have that much of an understanding, but also taking it from in its historical context, which is what we just read in this last week's Parsha, in Parsha Slech Lecha. God gave Avram a mitzvah of circumcision which ran counter to everything that he was trying to accomplish. And when you think about it, um, Avraham was the great Mikarev. He was the great uh, bringing, the bringer of people closer to Hashem. So everything's going great. He invites them into his tent, and he gives them a beautiful Shabbos and a beautiful Devar Torah. And beautiful Zemirot, if we can imagine that he was singing songs and telling them about how God is compassionate and loving and giving and benevolent and all of these other wonderful traits. And then all of a sudden says, God, God sends Avraham a message. He says, Avraham, I have a new mitzvah for you. It's the mitzvah of circumcision. This is something that I want you to do and all of your adherents as well. Circumcision, it's the sign of a covenant. There's no rhyme or reason for it, but I want you to do it anyway. Now imagine Avraham, up until now, has been a great salesman, been a great pitchman for Judaism. All of a sudden, he comes the next day to all of his adherents and says, My friends, I have a wonderful message from the Creator. A new commandment that God has given to us. And they all say, What? You? Where? And, and this, of course, is the great dilemma that Avraham has. And that's why this week's Parsha begins with the words, Vayeroi love Hashem ve'ilonei Mamre, that God appeared to Avraham in the plains of Mamre, where he was recuperating from his bris mila. And Rashi tells us that why is it necessary for us to know that he was dwelling in the plains of Mamre? And who is this fellow Mamre? And Rashi tells us that Mamre 
was one of Avraham's Hasidim, one of, one of Avraham Avinu's adherents. Um, and Avraham had actually consulted with Mamre regarding this mitzvah of circumcision. And the simple understanding is he wanted to know, should we do it, should we not do it? Which, of course, is very puzzling. I mean, it's, it's puzzling to consider that Avram would hesitate even for an instant in performing God's commandment. What was he consulting Mamre about? So some of the commentaries say that he was so, he, he, did, he had no problem himself giving himself a circumcision. The issue is, how do I sell this? How do I promulgate this to the rest of our adherents? And, and this was really what his dilemma was. Do I just initially keep it among my family and not share it with the rest of the people who want to learn about ethical monotheism? Or is this something that I should try and convince the larger populace who have followed me up until now to adhere to, to the commandments? Some commentaries actually tell us that, you know, if you notice, there really are no remnants of those converts that Avram and Sarah had converted. What happened to them all? And there are a number of different answers to this question. Some say that, you know, Yitzchak, Avraham's son, had a different personality from Avraham, and he didn't have the charisma, and he didn't have that nature of reaching out to other people, and so eventually these people sort of fell away. Others explain that it was because they just, you know, as Hashem gave this mitzvah to Avram of bris milah, it just became impractical for the adherents to remain part of the formal fold of what we call Judaism. Now that's not to say that Avram did not continue his work of spreading the message of ethical monotheism. It's just that if you wanted to be part of the initiated class of the Jewish people, you got a circumcision, right? But you could be a follower of Avraham and still be a righteous Gentile. And that's really what Avraham was trying to accomplish. But this was part of the dilemma that Avraham was facing, yes? When you look at this objectively today, it does seem a bit bizarre, but in the historical context, with it all that strange, you know, in pagan rituals, people things to their body? I mean, was it as bizarre then as we think it is now? Th that's a very good question. I was going to say just the opposite, that today we know the health benefits of circumcision. The uh, New York Times article of about 10 years ago quoted a um, New England Journal of Medicine study that the spread of, uh, of AIDS has been curtailed by 50% in the African continent because of circumcision. So it actually makes a lot of sense today from a medical point of view. I don't know what the uh, social societal mores were back then. Certainly people were doing a lot of different things to their bodies. Tattoos were certainly in vogue and other types of mutilation, but it's not clear that circumcision was one of those things. And it, it may very well be that um, circumcision was, was chosen because it was dafka, one of the things that people were not doing at the time. Okay, so that's why the example was chosen as bris mila. But then in paragraph number eight, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi takes it one step further. He says, the Kuzari, now here is the Khazar king speaking about bris mila. He's the king who has converted to Judaism. And he says, you have indeed accepted this commandment properly. You perform it with great zeal, with many well-wishers attending. You praise God during its performance, and you recall its origin and purpose when you recite the circumcision blessing. This, is, uh, this harkens to the Gemara that says, in footnote 29, the Gemara says, any mitzvah which the Jewish people accepted with joy, such as circumcision, they still perform with joy. There have been movements beginning in the 19th century with the advent of the Reformation or the Haskalah, that sought to do away, that there were Jews themselves that thought this was an act of barbarism and they sought to do away with bris milah. But those movements, some of which still exist today, are really not, um, not uh, they don't seem to be taking for whatever reason. I think that, you know, the medical benefits of bris milah, of circumcision, really were orchestrated by Hashem to make sure that the Jewish people would continue happily 
continuing the sign of the bris today. As a moil who's done many brisim, I can tell you that um, even people who are very, very far from traditional observance still feel very, very connected to this mitzvah, by and large. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to see. I remember doing a bris under a Christmas tree <laughs> when I was living in California. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so it just, but it just goes to show. It just goes to show that no matter how far, they still take this particular rite very seriously. Okay. And then he says, Yishmoel and Persia have taken pains to emulate you. Yishmoel and Persia seem to be a reference to Muslims who circumcise at the age of 13, but they have only felt the pain of this rite without the accompanying pleasure that one receives when he considers the reason for enduring, whoops, for enduring this pain. Now, this is a bit of a harsh statement that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi makes. He basically says that Muslims circumcise themselves just like you do, but they don't feel the sense of satisfaction in per the performance of this rite that Jews experience when they perform the mitzvah of circumcision. Now, how does he know this? And, where, wh and what, what gives rise for him to say this? Um, let's hold that thought for just a moment. By the way, Maimonides says that um, the difference between an Ishmaelite or uh, uh, these are descendants of Avram who have a, who according to some still have a mitzvah of circumcision of some kind, but they do only a partial circumcision. Sir, a bris mila involves a two-step process of mila and puria, of removal of the foreskin. And then, and then a um, usually it's a, uh, a dorsal tear of the mucosal membrane which surrounds the glands of the organ, which basically means a complete exposure of the of the head of the of the male organ. And Yishmaelites, according to Maimonides, only perform the excision of the foreskin without the re the removal or bringing down of the mucosal tissue, mucosal membrane. Um, so that could be one thing that Rabbi Yehuda Levi is alluding to, is that they don't do it fully, and therefore they experience the pain, but not the full pleasure of the right. But I don't think that that's what he's referring to. If we look at the next paragraph, the rabbi says, Yishmael and Persia have been unsuccessful in their other attempts to emulate us. Look at the day of rest they have established instead of the Shabbat. Is there any comparison? They resemble us as much as a statue resembles a living person. There is an attempt to imitate, but that attempt falls flat, is essentially the theme of what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is describing. The Khazar king had mentioned it within the context of bris mila, of circumcision. The rabbi then responds and says, not only have they fallen flat with circumcision, but also in trying to imitate us with a day of rest. <coughs> I want to hearken back to uh, something that we saw in the second essay, paragraph number 30, if you want to just flip back in your books, on page 198, we had seen a very similar citation um, about 80 pages ago. What page, page 198. And here, Rabbi Huda Halevi was describing the vision of Ezekiel, the dry bones of Ezekiel. And he had, he had said that, you know, the Jewish people today pale by comparison of what they used to be. And that's why Ezekiel has this vision of the atzamot yveshot, of the dry bones. Uh, what, he says, we have no real body, just scattered bones akin to the dry bones that Yechezkel saw in his vision. Nevertheless, king of the Khazars, these bones have some remnant of life left in them. For they once were utensils for the head, heart, life force, spirit, and soul, referring to the temple, the kohanim, the prophets, and so forth. They are therefore better off than the intact bodies whose head, eyes, ears, and remaining parts are as if made of stone and plaster. These bodies never had the spirit of life within them, nor is it possible that it ever will reside in them. Rather, they are forms that resemble man, but are really not man. 
Adam ve'enam Adam is the way that is the Hebrew. They are man, but they are not really man. Um, and we actually say this in our Hallel, right? There's a paragraph in the Hallel from the book of Psalms, from the book of Tehillim, um, chapter 115, that says, describes the idolatry of the other nations. Pelahem velo yidaberu. They have a mouth, but they do not speak. Einayim lahem velo yiru. They have eyes, but cannot see. Aznayim lahem velo yishmo. They have ears, but cannot hear. Af lahem velo yirichun. They have a nose, but cannot smell. Yidehem velo yimishun. They have hands, but cannot feel. Raglehem velo yalechun. They have legs, but cannot walk. And then at the end of that it, whole description, it says, Kimohem yihiyu osehem. Their idols are just like the, the fashioners of the idols. Those who fashion the idols also live lives which they have all of the faculties of humanity, but they don't utilize their humanity in the proper way. That's at least one way of understanding that line in, in the Hallel. And so Rabbi Yehuda Levi is really just echoing the words of King David. But what does he really mean by this? Do you, do you remember there was something called the Bayless Trials in Russia about a hundred years ago? The famous trial of uh, the, the, a blood libel against a, Drew, uh, a Jew named Bayless who um, was accused of killing a Christian child. And this was an opportunity for, um, for members of the um, of the Russian government to bring charges against Judaism in general. And one of the charges was this whole very idea that according to the Talmud that only Jews are called Adam, but non-Jews are not called Adam, they're not called human. And they use this as a way of showing, you see, that Jews don't take Gentile life seriously. They don't even consider us human beings, and therefore, of course, they would uh, cavalierly do away with our lives and would have no compunction at all if they don't consider us to be human. And um, the chief rabbi of Moscow at the time had to respond. And his response was that the word Adam represents a sense of unification. We as the Jewish people are collectively called Adam in that there are Jews in the United States and Jews in England who have heard about the Bayless blood libel and they have all come forward because when one Jew is in trouble, all Jews feel it. And that's all the Talmud meant when it said that you are called Adam, you the Jewish people are called one human being, and the other nations are disparate, are scattered all over. But we're all human beings. And the truth is, is that everyone was created in the image of God. And that's truly what we, what we do believe. So then the question is, what is being, what is being uh, portrayed over here? What is Rabbi Yehuda Halevi talking about when he says that um, the other nations, uh, their religious practices are like statues when compared to the Jewish people. So I don't think he's casting aspersions on their humanity. I think what he's saying, and this is what we're getting to in our discussion over here, is that any time you try to imitate the original and in any way try to water it down or alter it, you will eventually fall flat. And that's what happened with circumcision. Rabbi Yehuda Levi's thesis is that if you do a mitzvah with the, with the um, confidence that it is being commanded to you by Hashem, then even if you don't understand the reason for the mitzvah, you feel a sense of satisfaction in that you're doing something that's good and correct. But if you're doing, fulfilling a commandment where you know that the origins of that commandment have been altered from its original. So you don't feel that sense of confidence and you won't therefore feel the sense of satisfaction in the performance of that mitzvah. That's Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's thesis. And he says that subconsciously on some level, the other nations know that the way that they're doing the mitzvah is not in the prescribed way because either they're not obligated to perform circumcision or they're doing the Sabbath in the wrong way, and therefore their performance pales by comparison. Especially when it comes to the uh, Sabbath of the other nations that he's referring now, which is Islam and Christianity, in each 
of those religions, there was an alteration of the original day of Sabbath. You see, when the Jewish people, and this is where we get into a discussion of Shabbat. When the Jewish people observe Shabbos, we observe Shabbos for two reasons, which we echo in the Kiddush every Friday night. What are the two reasons why we observe Shabbos? Anyone want to remind us? Yes. On the seventh day, Hashem rested. Well, that's reason number one, to to remind us of the act of creation and that we have to fulfill... Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the directive to emulate God. God rested on the seventh day, so we rest on the seventh day. And what's the second reason? Zecher <coughs> liyitziat Mitzrayim, as a reminder of the exodus from Egypt. Because there too, we were formed into a people with the responsibility of bearing witness to Hashem's universe, that God is providential. And therefore, that too is... Um, is the reason why we uh, observe the Shabbat is to sort of reaffirm that God is in control of the universe and therefore there is some kind of resonance between his world and our domain. And the Shabbos really represents the fact that God is directly involved in our lives, uh, which, is what the, uh, which is what the Exodus is representative of. If you look at the origins of the Sabbath in Christianity and the Sabbath in Islam, you'll discover that when they changed the day of observance from Saturday to Sunday and from Saturday to Friday, respectively, you'll also note that they made sometimes drastic and sometimes subtle changes as to the reason for the day of Sabbath. Sabbath literally means a time of rest. But the Christian Sabbath and the Islamic Sabbath are not necessarily interpreted as as days of rest, which is why um, both Christians and Muslims traditionally have not used these days necessarily as days of refraining from work, but rather as days of either recreation or prayer. So this is just from Wikipedia. Sabbath in Christianity, in your handout, Sabbath in Christianity is the inclusion or adoption in Christianity of a Sabbath day. Established within Judaism through Mosaic law, Christians inherited a Sabbath practice that reflected two great precepts, the commandment to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and God's blessing of the seventh day, Saturday, is a day of rest in the Genesis creation narrative. But the position now dominant in Western Christianity is that observance of the Lord's Day, Sunday, supplanted or superseded the Sabbath commandment and that the former celebrated the Christian community's deliverance from captivity to sin, Satan, and worldly passions made possible by the resurrection on the first day of the week. So you see that Christian Sabbath is not a commemoration of creation, but Christian Sabbath is a commemoration of the resurrection. And early Christians observed the seventh day with prayer and rest, but they also gathered on the first day. By the fourth century, Christians were officially observing the first day Sunday as their day of rest, not the seventh. So uh, that's why the Sabbath does not, the Sunday does not have the same religious significance to Christians as Shabbat does to Jews. Many do take it seriously. I'm not here to belittle Christian practice, but one thing is clear is that the significance of Shabbos, and we're going to learn more about this as we go on through the text, The next page or two in the Kuzari deals with the specialness of the Jewish Shabbos and how it is preserved, the key to the preservation of the Jewish people. But one thing is clear is that when Sunday superseded Saturday, it wasn't just the shifting of a day, but it was a shifting of the source of that commemoration. Sunday is not a commemoration of creation and rest, but rather it's a commemoration of the Christian belief in in, in their Lord's resurrection and therefore it's not as connected to the obligation to rest as it used to be. And the same thing is true of Sabbath in Islam, and which is the next part. The Quran acknowledges a six-part creation period and the biblical Sabbath as the seventh day, Yom al-Sabt. But Allah's mounting the throne after creation is taken in contradistinction to Elohim's concluding and resting from his labors. And so Muslims replace Sabbath rest with Jum'ah, also known as Friday prayer. And so Friday in, in, how do you say Friday in Arabic? Yoma al-Juma'ah. 
It's the day of Juma'ah means to gather, to gather, to congregate, to gather together. Is a congregational pair, Salat, held every Friday, just after midday, in place of the otherwise daily Dhur prayer. It commemorates the creation of Adam on the sixth day as a lovely gathering of Adam's children, of Adam's descendants. The Quran states, when the call is proclaimed to prayer on Friday, hasten earnestly to the remembrance of Allah and leave off business. That is best for you if ye but knew. The next verse, when the prayers ended then dispersed in the land, leads many Muslims not to consider Friday a rest day as in Indonesia, which regards the seventh day of Shabbos as unchanged, but many Muslim countries such as Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bangladesh do consider Friday a non-work day, a holiday, or a weekend, and other Muslim countries like Pakistan count it as half a rest day after the Friday prayer is over. Juma attendance is strictly incumbent upon all free adult males who are legal residents of the locality. So, again, a disconnect. Now, historically, we know why in the 4th century Saturday was supplanted with Sunday. We know historically why in Islam Friday was chosen instead of Shabbos. In other words, the only way, the, the, the most significant way to distinguish yourself as a separate religion is to create a different special day every week. So Shabbos is for the Jews, so the Christians chose Sunday, and Muslims chose Friday. But when, once you disconnect from the day of rest aspect of Shabbos, and both the sanctification of Shabbos plus the, 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 um, the, the, this, the obligation to not work on Shabbos, so then it, it no longer has the same significance. And therefore, it's, a sta- it's the practice of Shabbos is like looking at a statue versus looking at a human being. And that's Rabbi Yehuda Levy's point. I'll take questions.